Today's today's daf Yomi is Yivamos Nun Beis, and we're studying this on Yom HaShoah. So we, of course, remember all those uh, who were murdered in the Shoah. We study in their memory as well. So today's daf Yomi, we start in the bottom of Nun Aleph on the Beis, the last four words that our Mishnah had said. There's no get after a get. There's no divorce after a divorce with respect to a Yivama. And then it says, what does this mean, Kate said, what does it mean? And it gives an example that's completely unrelated to a get after a get. It gives an example of somebody who does Mimer uh, with his Yavama, and then it gives her a get that she, that she still requires Chalitza. So the Gemara on the top of 52a asks this question, I get, Achar get too? That's not a get after a get. That's talking about a totally different scenario. So I'm Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda explains, this is what it means. Get achar get umamar achar maimar kedamar. In the case of a divorce after a divorce and a maimar after a maimar, those are like we said originally, meaning to say that those you don't need an explanation for. But yavama achar yavama, yavam echad vivama achas, ketzad hatarasan. If you have one yavam and one yavama, how do you, how do you release the yavama? So the, the case is us a mimer be so that if you do this betrothal, this mimer on his yavama v'nasal get, and then he gives her a divorce, she menu chalitza. She still requires chalitza from her, from him. So now, we're, so now the Mishnah had said us a mimer v'al arezu kumitzvasa. So again, the, what's the biblical law of yibum is that you're supposed to marry. The, your brother's widow. That's called ibum. Technically speaking, that's effectuated through bia, through the act of intercourse. But our Mishnah, but the rabbis instituted, and we're going to discuss it in today's daf. The rabbis instituted that because it's that you don't go straight into the bia, but first you do a betrothal. I mean, you say, "I'm going to betroth you." That's what the brother-in-law says to his widow, to his brother's widow. So our Mishnah said that if you do Mimer and then you do the Bia, that that is the, that, that is the mitzvah. The Gemara says, Rafuna. Maybe this supports Rafuna's position because what do Rafuna say? Rafuna taught, Dam Rafuna mitzvah sivama v'kadesh v'achkach po. Rafuna said that the mitzvah of Yibam is that you first do this betrothal and then and then after you do the betrothal, you do the BR, meaning to say that Rafuna says that when it comes to Yibum, you're supposed to do Mimer and then Bia. So that is, so that seems to be, our mission seems to be support for Rafuna. So the says, no, not necessarily. Maybe all it means is that if you do Mimer and then you do Bia, that that's okay. That's also it's also acceptable as part of the mitzvah of Yibum. Mar says, well, Pshita, that's obvious, of course. You did the Bia in the, in the end there, of course it's obvious. How could you ever think that by doing the Bia after the Mimer, that that would be a problem? You did, you did Mimer and then you did the Bia, of course it's okay. Now the Mar says, no, Sakadai the Chamina, you might have thought that you actually messed things up by doing the Mimer in the first place. You might have thought, Kivan the Mar, because we have a principle, Ha'osa Maimar be of Vamasa. We have earlier, we had this, remember, we had this on 29b, that if you do Maimar on your Yavama, that the Maimar is this act of betrothal and it's not the, the sexual act. So you might have there, so it said there on 29b, Parachay Menu Zikas Yavamin, that you've, you've disintegrated the connection of Yibum through. Through through this zika, the whole of zikas erusim and nisuin, and now we have this connection through like a normal marriage, through betrothal and marriage. So you might have thought imalav mitzvah kavod. You might have thought, well, now that you've done the mimer, you messed up the yibum, and you're not doing the mitzvah anymore. So you might have thought that the mimer actually made things worse. Kamashla, no, that you could do the mimer and then do the yibum. And according to everybody that, that, that you've done the mitzvah, even though we don't necessarily have to follow Rafuna's position, that this is the proper way to do Yibam by first doing Mimer. So, so now let's analyze Rafuna's position. What did Rafuna say? Rafuna said, Gufa, Amr Rafuna, mitzvah Yivamin, Mekadesh, Rafuna says that the mitzvah of Yibam 
is that first you do the betrothal. First you say to her, will you be my bride? Uh, or we'll see that you could do it also via contract. You do or money, you add whatever way you do it through money or a contract. And then and then you do the via the intercourse. So the involve but if you did the bia first and only then did you say, now will you be my bride, then we're going to say kone, that it's still an effective way of consummating the Yibam relationship. The Gemara says, what are you talking about? That's obvious. In Baal Basar Maimar Pshita, the Kanye of Abiyah. Of course, if you had the intercourse and then you say, will you be my bride? Of course, that's effective because you've you've effectuated with it with the sexual act. Why would we think that's not effective? So the Gemara says, okay, reword what he said. Ela uh, Ema, read it as follows. In Baal Kana. That, that if you did the Bia without first doing this betrothal, it's still an effective way of doing the Yibam relationship. Gemara says, but, but is that really the case? But we have a Brisa that states, Vatanya Loka. We have another source that states, we're in the middle of 52a, we have another source that states that if you do the Bia for the Yibam relationship without first betro- doing the Maimar, we're going to give you lashes. We give you lashes under those circumstances. The Gemara says, yeah, that's Makos Mardos. Yeah, those lashes, even though we're giving you lashes, those are rabbinic lashes. So understand that the Torah says that you're supposed to do yibum via bia, via this intercourse. The rabbi said, if you do that directly without first betrothing, you're going to get lashes because the rabbis said that that was a vulgar act. And not only that, in general, the Torah says that there are three ways you can be, you can betroth a woman. The, the three ways to betroth the woman are through kasef, through money, through star, through a contract, or through bia, through the through the sexual act. But but now the Gemara says the rav mangin man the mekadesh bia. Rav used to give lashes on somebody who who was betrothed a woman through the sexual act. Means say even though the Torah allows it, Rav would give you lashes if that's what you did. Rav gave lashes to the person who did this. Um, so so. So Uman the Mikadesh Bashuka, Rav also gave lashes to the person who betrothed in the marketplace, meaning to say that if there was a uh, person who betrothed somebody in the marketplace, he just went over to her and said, in the marketplace, will you marry me? That's vulgar. Uman the Mikadesh below Shiduchi, and also a person who betrothed without first thing, doing Shiduchi, which is like a conversation, you know, get, ter- making out the terms of the wedding and all that. Rav also gave them lashes. Gita. Rav also gave lashes to somebody who nullified a get. After he, he, he gave an agent and he, and he said, bring the get to my bride, technically speaking, he's allowed to annul it. But Rav gave lashes to that person who annulled it uh, because maybe she wouldn't know about it and then she'll get married and then she wouldn't realize the get was nullified and then she's creating, uh, she's a married woman when she's with, this other, with other men. And she's creating them's hair. So to Manta Masar Muda Gita, a person who gave a get, but he said, This get is nullified. He gave a, a statement before he gave it that this get is invalid, even though technically speaking, the get's invalid. Rav gave the lashes to such a person for the same reason. The word Pakir Rashi says is chutzpah, somebody who acts with arrogance towards the agents of the court. The agents of the court are really messengers of Hashem because the court is acting with the authority of God. So somebody who's, who's acting with chutzpah to them, Rav would put lashes upon them. Also, Rav gave lashes to a person who was excommunicated by the court for 30 days, and he didn't try to, to deal with that excommunication by going to the court and making a claim that it's not fair. So such a person, Rav gave lashes to. And also, and this is... Uh, this is an, an interesting case. A person who a uh, son-in-law lived with his in his mother-in-law's home, that there was the concern that it would lead to adultery. So therefore they say you're not supposed to live in your mother-in-law's home. Now, obviously, today a lot of people live in their, their in-law's home, and that's for good reasons, maybe financial reasons or or they need help or something. So if you have a good reason to live there, then it's okay. But here, but here in this case where there was a concern of adultery, they said, Rav gave lashes to the person who lived there. And the Gemara says right away, the daughter in the Chalaf, well, if you just live there, it's a problem, but not if you're just passing through. 
But there was once a case where there was a person who just passed through his mother-in-law's home and Rav Sheshis gave him lashes. Mar says, no, who made them of a dayam mecham No, that's because that person was um, suspected of adultery with his mother-in-law. That's why Rav Sheshis gave him lashes. And the Ardai, I mean, the people from the Ardai said, Bekul, Bekul, Rav, didn't give, the Ardai said, our version is, Rav didn't give lashes to any of these people, except for the one who betrothed through the sexual act without first having a conversation about uh, that we're going to get betrothed and spelling out the, the parameters of the relationship. Others say, some say even that even um, that even if you have a prearranged it, it would still be vulgar to betroth the woman in this manner through the sexual act, and so therefore would, he would still give lashes. So now we've been discussing at length the last uh, couple of weeks this concept of mimer. What's mimer is this betrothal before the even before the sexual consummation. So the Gemara says, what is this Maimer? Tan Rabbanam, Kates and Maimer. It's always the case the Gemara first discusses something and then it dis- defines it. So first we were having all this discussion about Maimer without actually saying what it is. So what is the Maimer? Nasa Makasef, Oshava Kasef, Ubishtar. So what's Maimer? If he gives her the money or he gives her the equivalent of money or a contract and he says, you're betrothed to me. Kates and Bishtar, how do you do this with the contract? The Gemara says, what do you mean, Kate Sebastian? Kid Amran, what do you mean, how do you betroth someone with a contract? Like we've talked about, Kosovo, Niar, Cheres, you write to her on a piece of paper, on a powder shard, Afal Pisha, Mosheva Puta, the paper doesn't have to be worth even a penny, but you write on it, Harayat Mukudesh, you say you're betrothed to me. That's my mark. You write on a piece of paper, a powder shard, you're betrothed to me. So, what do you mean, how do you do with paper? So, Amar Bai, no, Hachikamar, this is the question. Stark Suvas Yavaman Kate said, How do we do the Kasuva to the Yavaman? That's the that's the question. So let's take a step back. That in every marriage, the, there's a Ksuba that you need to, that a man needs to give his bride. And that's the Ksuba is basically a bond that, that if, in the event that a man will terminate the marriage either through his own death or through divorcing his bride, that he's obligated to that he puts up a bond and that bond there's a lien on the entire estate from the moment of the marriage that 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 property is is a bond to the bride so you can't be married even for one night with two you can't stay married without if you lose the ksuba you have to replace it right away you can't even be spend one night with your bride without a ksuba so the Gemara says that the question here is what about for a yibam the yibam the Yavaman, she, she falls to marriage to the to the brother. So what's the story there with the Ksuba? So so we say it has to be as follows. Cost of what? He has to write there. The, the brother who marries his, his brother or his wife, he has to write there, Anaponi, Barponis, Kabilas, he has ponis, Yivamasi, Alai Lazun, or Farnasakarai. He said, I accept upon myself to uh, support my Yavama properly. But the Ksuba, the bond, comes from my brother's estate, not from my estate. We said earlier in the Talmud, that's because she fell and married him from heaven. So, so to speak, so the Ksuba goes to the brother's estate. Let's say the first brother ran out of money. The rabbis instituted Mishani, the rabbis instituted that the second person has to pay the ksuba from his own estate. Kidei shelo shelo tehei kawa be'ena votziah. What's the, one of the purposes of the mayor of the ksuba is this bond? We want to make it a not so easy to terminate the marriage because anytime everybody somebody has a fight, we don't want to just right away terminate the marriage. So you put up a bond, of, let's say a lot of money, then it will be difficult to to divorce her. And so therefore, that's the purpose of the ksuba. So in this case also, even if the first brother runs out of money, we make the second brother put up a ksuba from his estate, so it's not easy to divorce her. So by the way, there's a lien on the property. property. There's a a lien on the whole property. That's what a ksuba is. A ksuba is a lien on the property. The whole estate is mortgaged to to the woman. And the second one, the lead becomes then his promises to, to provide. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Substance. Exactly. Exactly. So, Abaye asked Rabbi the following question. 
No, someone get, let's say he gives her a get. So if he says you're divorced from me, but you're not permitted to any other person. Now in a regular get, a regular case of divorce, this would not be effective. But what about in the case of Yibum? Is that going to be effective? So, so regularly speaking, you can't say I'm divorcing you, but you're not allowed to marry anybody else. That's not, that's not, a, that's not a valid divorce. What's the story with respect to Yibum? And the Gemara says the question as follows. Get Yivama the Rabbanan who get, who get the Mahani Beishasish Mahani Biyavama. Get lo Mahani Beishasish lo Mahani Biyavama. So the, what's the whole concept of a get by a Yibum? It's really not the way we terminate a Yibum relationship. It's really terminated only with Chalitza. But the rabbis instituted this concept of a divorce as a way of uh, terminating part of the relationship. So therefore, maybe we only say that it's a, a valid get if it will be a valid get in the, with respect to a regular marriage. But in this case, it's not valid with respect to a regular marriage to divorce a woman in this manner. So therefore, maybe this is not a valid uh, divorce by Yibum also. Or maybe if we don't allow this get, if we say it's not effective, then you're going to say any get that it gives is not effective. And then he's going to do Yibam with her after he's given her this get, and that's a prohibition. So what do we say? Is this get, after he gives her this type of get, is he allowed to do Yibam with her? We say, no, once he gives this type of get, he can't do Yibam with her because we're concerned he might switch it with another Get and mess things up in the future. Maske for Rabbi Bar Hanan. So Rabbi Hanan says, "Al miato yaivu near Rabbi Alma." Well, you're saying if he gives her anything, we're going to come to confuse her with another get. That's he even gave her a piece of paper. Achi not just a regular piece of paper says you're divorced. It's not effective in general. But Achi not possibly you want to say, well, now he's also disqualified her. I'm away. No. So they say, that, what's the distinction? Hasam or possible the Kahuna. There in that case. By giving her a get like that, you just write a piece of paper, you're divorced. She's not disqualified to be with her, with her husband if her husband was a Kohen. Normally, a divorced woman's prohibited to be with a Kohen, but that's, not, that's nothing. But also, in this case, it's possible kahuna. But if you say you're divorced to me, but you're not allowed to marry anybody else, she's not allowed to return to her husband. That's enough of a divorce to say she can't go back to her husband if he's a Kohen. Tanya, Isha, Grushama, Isha, Yikapo, the verse states, Woman who was divorced from her husband, he cannot marry, which means even if she was only divorced from her husband, in that case where the Kohen says to his wife, you're divorced from me, but you can't marry anybody else, that is the case. Uh, that's what's called the smell of a get, the scintilla of a get. She's disqualified from returning to a Kohen husband. Amar Ami Barchama, so Ami Barchama said the following scenario, Ari Amru, Echad Lulab, Amar Echad Lulabwar, if a person stated to the scribe, write a get for my betrothed bride, and when I'm fully marry her, I'll divorce her. Well, that's actually a valid divorce, because at the moment that he says that this, this, this phrase, he, he uh, write it, and when I fully marry her, I'll divorce her, that's okay. A valid get because at that moment he has the ability to divorce her because betrothal in Jewish law actually requires a divorce to terminate that relationship. But but if it was we're on the top of 52b, but if it was just a regular woman in front who he has no relationship with, who he's not betrothed to, it's not a valid get. Because he has no ability to divorce her. So that it's only a get, it says, if he says, right, again, needs to be written with the proper intent. So it's only considered a valid get if he says, write it. And when I get fully married, I'll divorce you. If he says, write it, and I'll divorce you later, if he has at that moment the ability to divorce her. So that in that context, why Rami Barhama, Rami Barhama asks the following question. Well, you have a muscle, mahu. To his Yavama, if he says this to his Yavama, if he says for the scribe, write this, and when I consummate the relationship with this woman who's fallen to me, who I need to do even with, what's the law? Even the Agidabe, Karusasa Dami, do we say that since there's a Zika with her, she's like his betrothed bride, uh, and so therefore he can do it. Udilma, keep it low, Maimar, low. Or do we say no, because he hasn't done uh, Maimar with her, he's never betrothed her yet, maybe. It's it's not effective. So the Mara says, take you. We're going to leave this question unresolved. Take you.
Mara says the following: By Rav Hananya, Rav Hananya says cost of get was he cost all below him amaro. That's he did mimer with her. So now he has this quasi relationship called the mimer, but he also has a zika. She's fallen to him. He knew him. He didn't fully consummate the marriage yet. He always done mimer with her. Now Rav Hananya says, let's say for whatever reason, he says I'm writing a get <coughs> to uproot the zika. The, this connection, but not the mimer connection, or the opposite. The mamara below is ikaso. He says, "I'm uprooting the mimer, but not the zika." Mahu. What's the law there? Do we say mimer eli zika karami? Do we say that the mimer is added on to the zika? So basically, when you do mimer, you have both a zika and a mimer relationship. Is that what we're saying? And so, therefore, you can't just divorce one aspect of it because that's like divorcing half a woman, which is not a, which is not able to do. It's like you're divorcing half of a bride, and that's nothing. Or maybe we've seen there are two independent things, the two independent entities. And so therefore, so therefore, it is effective that you can divorce that aspect. And then if you did the mimer and you divorced her, then maybe she'd be able to marry a different one of the brothers. Or maybe you're left with the original Zika. So the Mara says, why don't we answer this from the case of Rava? The Amar Rava, we had this case back on 32A. Rava said, <laughs> that in a case where you did, uh, where a woman had fallen to Yibum with you, the case here is, Rashi says, we're talking about a case of there were two Yavamin who fell before three brothers who, are, who were married to three the three different women, and one of the brothers died, and the second brother comes along and does mimer with the first woman, and then he and then he dies. So then we say that those women all have to do chalitza naivim. But let's say there was a circumstance where Rabbi says, where he after he did mimer, he gave her a get, and then he died. So then we're going to say that that man, the second brother who died, his wife is allowed to do. Uh, um, who she's allowed to do Yibam with the third brother. Why? Uh, because, because the Mimer has removed, because since he did get to the Mimer, so therefore she this she is not this other woman is not connected to the co-wife. And so we see from here, uh, so we see from here that you can do get Achar Mimer according to Rafa. So the Gemara says, well, Rafa Pshito Elo Rafanaya me by way. So, so to Rav, it was obvious you could get after the Bible, but Rav Hananya was uncertain, and so the Gemara says, my take, and again, we leave that unresolved. Now, what's the next case? The next case is that it said in our Mishnah that once you've done the Chalitza, nothing takes effect anymore. Now, let's say you did Chalitza, and then you did Mimer after the Chalitza. You, you, the Chalitza severs the marriage, and so the Mimer that you've done afterwards is betrothal to this woman, it's completely ineffective. You've done nothing. So the Gemara says it must be that our Mishnah is like Rabbi Akiva because Rabbi Akiva is out of principle because once you've done Chalitza with this woman who falls to you in Yibam, your sister-in-law, you're no longer allowed to ever marry her. That's called Lo Yivna. That there's a prohibition. Since you didn't marry her and you did the Chalitza, now she refers to the relationship originally, which was your brother's bride, which you're never allowed to marry. So you can only marry her within the context of Yibam. So Rabbi Akiva says, why is the Chalitza not effective? It must be that our mission follows the position of Rabbi Akiva, who says that if you try to do a betrothal, a kedushin in a situation where the marriage is not effective, it doesn't. it's not even binding at all. And so therefore, that's why if you do the, you do the mamar after Chalitza, it's like nothing. It's just like spinning into the wind. So the Gemara says, "Amar Rabbi Yudam Rav Zudav Rabbi Akiva." That our Mishnah says that there's nothing after the Chalitza it takes effect. That's the position of Rabbi Akiva. Says, "Ain Kedushin Tosim Mechayvei Lav." And he says, when it comes to a prohibition, the Kedushin, the marriage, it's not, it doesn't take effect. It's like if you try to marry by by American law your sister. Let's say you go into court and say, "I'm marrying." It will be completely ineffective. You're not married; though, it won't take effect. So that's what Rabbi Akiva says here. And the Chachamim the sages say, Yesh after Chalitza Kum. The sages say, No, if you do the Mimer after Chalitza, it does take effect and you're in violation of the prohibition and you're going to need a divorce to terminate that relationship. So the Gemara says, I mean, Matzah's Mukhmis like Rabbi Akiva. Do we really want to establish that our Mishnah has to be like Rabbi Akiva? But the first clause of our Mishnah says, 
Nasan get for us a mimer. And if you gave her a divorce to the Yavama and then you did mimer, Tsucha get the chalitza. You require a get for that mimer and also chalitza. The ik Rabbi Akiva. And if you want to say it really, it's like Rabbi Akiva, Akiva the Yavwa get, once you gave her a get, Mima Hani by Mimer. Does the Mimer really take effect after the get? You've already divorced her. Ratanya, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Nayla, Nos, and Gel, even Maso. Shinesro, Lavo, Lamas. Rabbi Akiva says if you gave a get to a woman who falls to even with you, she's going to be forever. As it says, Yucho, Bala, Rishon, Asher, Shalcha. That, that you're not allowed to remarry her once you gave her the get. Ahar, Shiluach. So, meaning to say, after you sent her away, you can't marry her there. Um, Ravashi, no, Ravashi says, Rabbi Kiva says it would take effect here because get Yivamin Midrabanan, because the get by Yibam is only rabbinically takes effect. The cross, the verse is just support. It's not a real verse, and so therefore the condition is binding, it's just rabbinically uh, a, a get. As the Gemara says, indeed, we, we learned this. I'm a Rabbi, ain't a Amur Meladivir Rabbi Akiva, that when it says in our Mishnah that after Chalitza nothing takes effect, that's only said according to the position of Rabbi Akiva. Shaya Ose Chalutza Ke'erva, he says the Chalutza is like the prohibitive relationship like we have in our in our Torah portion, chapter 18 of Leviticus, that, that after you give the Chalitza to her, Rabbi Akiva says nothing will take effect, nothing is binding there. I have a Chachamim Omer, but Rabbi says the Chachamim are the position, Yeshachar Chalitza Kurm, that even though you've done Chalitza, Anything you do after the fact will be binding and you'll need a divorce to terminate that. The Neomer, Rebbe says, Rebbe often in Shah says a Neomer, this is an act of humility. He was saying, this is just my personal opinion, even though I'm the editor of the whole Mishnah, it's just my personal opinion. Emosai, when do we say this, that it doesn't take effect? But when do we say that, that after you've done Chalitza, the next action takes effect? That is only... Where you betrothed her for the purpose of marrying her as a regular wife. But if, if you propose her for the purpose of her being your Yavama, then it's not effective because then the Chalitza is terminated and Zika and you can't do any action. So Tanya Yidach, we have another price that says something similar. Let's say you do Chalitza with your Yavama and then you go back and you betroth her. Rabbi Omer and Kitchel Shum Isha, Tsuchai Men of Get, with Shum Yvama and Tsuchai Men again. Rabbi says it depends what your intent was. If you intended to properly marry her, then he's going to be required to divorce her because it's a binding marriage that was prohibited. Whereas if you intended for her to be your Vama, your intent was completely off, so the marriage is not binding. The sages say it doesn't matter what your intent was, if it was for marriage or for your vama, she's going to require a get afterwards. And Amar Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yosef says, let me try to explain the position of Rabbi, who says it's completely dependent on what your intent was. My time at the Rabbi, so we, what's the scenario, a person who converts, it's like they're a new, new person and their relatives technically previously biological relatives don't inherit them. So if a ger dies, his property, since he didn't give it out before he died, his property is claimed by the first person who does a proprietary act on that property, like plowing the property. Let's say a guy borders the ger's property and he doesn't realize that it's the convert's property and he, and he doesn't realize the convert has died and he's plowing on that property, but he thought it was his own property. So we say under those circumstances, somebody who plows the convert's property and thinks it's his own, the Lokani, since his intent was, he wasn't intending to acquire it, even though he did the act of acquisition, he was just intending to plow his own field, he has not acquired it. And so to here, uh, since you, you, even though you betrothed this woman, since your intent in the betrothal was for Yibam and not from the other marriage, then we're going to say it's not effective. That's how Rav Yosef wants to explain the Abaye, the position of the sages. But Abaye, Rabbi Yosef's student, says to him, no, me dummy, the two cases are completely distinct. Also, we'll come and 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 There, in the case of the convert's property, the person who plowed that property wasn't intending to acquire the property. He was just intending to plow his own property. So there was no intent to acquire. But in this case, you were intending to marry. You're just doing a different type of marriage. So the two cases are not the same. 
Uh, he says, no, it's like a different case. It's like a case where you think, you, you know that that property next to you is now ownerless, but you think, thought it belonged to Gare A, but really it belongs to Gare B. So your intent was for the wrong Gare's property, but you intended to acquire it with your acquisition, and there it is affected. So therefore, Abai says, what's the logic here? Uh, we'll see what he's, Abai, Abai explains the logic. We'll see that, God willing, uh, tonight in tonight's stuff. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to address.